This morning, part two of our series, I Declare. If you weren't here last week, we're using Psalm 27, and we are making seven faith declarations out of Psalm 27. We covered the first three verses last week, and uh, the, the, our declaration from last week was, I will live life strong. And where we get a faith declaration is not just something that we make up. It's not just something that we hope for. It's something that we see in God's Word. And when David uh, spoke of God's strength and God dealing with him, that he never had to fear, didn't have to be afraid. Even if an army arrayed against him, he wouldn't fear. And if war broke out against him, even then he would be confident. And so what we do is we just... Uh, uh, summarize that a little bit into a statement that we can declare over our own life, I will live life strong. So can we start right there? Can we all just make that faith declaration over our lives this morning? I will live life strong. All right. The one other thing I ask you to do, actually challenge you to do is what? Memorize Psalm 27. Okay. So, so, so here, here's, here's a pop quiz. How you doing on that? Okay, now I'm, I'm getting reports of people that are memorizing ahead. That's great. Go for it. And I'm getting reports of other people saying, did you really mean that? <laughs> Does this look like a joking face? I didn't say it was my face was a joke. I, I, I'm not kidding. Okay. Because the power of putting God's word in your heart that, that will, will remain there and establish there for years. And uh, one other place this morning in Psalm or Isaiah uh, 35, I love the, the verse that talks about um, that we're to, to be the ones who strengthen uh, feeble hands and, and weak knees. And then it says, and say to those who are fearful hearted, do not be afraid. Say to them who are fearful hearted, do not be afraid. Your God will come with vengeance. He will surely come and will not delay. All right. And so we can speak those faith declarations, not only over our lives, but over someone else's life. And it's not just a, 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 an empty thing. You know, have you heard, had somebody with a religious spirit speak over your life and tell you what you should do in God? And it felt like it was much more condemning than it was affirming. Well, you should know better than that. Well, you should live different than that. Well, you sh that's not a faith declaration. In fact, that's using the Word of God in a legalistic sense to put burdens on people that obviously they're not in a place to bear. But when we use the Word of God to encourage one another, to build one another up, to exhort one another, then we can make a faith declaration over, our, over their life. We can meet them in a place that Isaiah said, where their we knees, where their wees were weak, and their knees were weak, whatever. If they're that mixed up, uh, and their hands are are feeble, that we can speak to them a word that brings strength. That that if somebody's fearful hearted, and all of us have been in that situation at one time or another, regardless of where it is, but we can speak into those situations and say to them. Be strong and do not fear. Now, it's one thing if somebody just says that over your life, oh, you shouldn't be afraid. But they don't make a connection with where you are or why you're afraid or understand the battle that you're in. But if someone comes alongside you and is willing to connect with that and say, listen, I understand what you're going through and I understand how it looks to me, but I'm also saying and encouraging you this morning, this is what God says. This is who God is. This is what God's word declares. And so we can say to them, be strong and do not fear. And so not only over our lives this morning, but I think we ought to make a faith declaration over somebody else's life. There's somebody sitting around you this morning that you, you might not know if they have feeble knees or, or, or weak hands or if they're fearful hearted. But let's just encourage one another with that. Would you just turn to somebody around you and would you just tell them our, our number one declaration is, I will live life strong. And then tell them now, you live life strong. Hallelujah. See, it feels good, doesn't it? So our second one this morning that we're going to cover is from verses 4 and 5 of Isaiah 27. 
verses 4, or excuse me, Psalm 27, verses 4 and 5, where David begins now to not just talk about his personal uh, 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 process of going through and, and declaring that he will live life strong, but one of the reasons David could make the declaration that he would live life strong is because he had such a passion for God's house. And so the second faith declaration that we're going to make over our life is not just, I will live life strong, but the second one is, I will love God's house passionately. Come on, can you say that with me this morning? I will love God's house passionately. All right, now let's go through and put verses 1 through 3 together with verses 4 and 5. Have you got them memorized yet? If not, you can practice. Don't cheat. Don't look. Just, just see if we can get it. Some of you said, you know, with the, with the offering proclamation that we make, it's really a faith declaration of our life because it's not just what we're saying, it's what God has already said in His Word. And we're just coming into agreement with it and declaring it over our life. It's not positive confession, it's a faith declaration because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How many of you have something in your life that you've asked God for, that you're praying for, that you're believing for, that you haven't seen yet. Maybe it's a breakthrough. Maybe it's a healing. That's fine. You can keep your hands up. Okay. That, that maybe it's an answer to a prayer for someone else. All right. And at that point is where our faith that we have to stand in a place of faith in what God has said and, and have our, it fixed in our heart. Faith comes by Hearing, hearing what? The Word of God. Faith doesn't just come by hearing other people's opinions. Faith doesn't come by hearing someone's exuberance. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And sometimes God speaks it in a whisper. Sometimes God shakes the mountain. Sometimes God thunders from heaven. When God spoke in the New Testament, it said, they, some just thought that it thundered. Well, every time it thunders during a storm, I'm thinking, there you go, Lord, speak. Go ahead, speak it. Amen? And so let, let's just quote the Word of God here together and, and recite it if you have it memorized in your heart. If not, I just encourage you to do that and take a, a few verses. Next week, we're just going to focus on one verse. And so I, I encourage you to do that and, and memorize it, get the Word down in your heart. Okay, so here we go. Uh, uh, Psalm 27 starts with saying what? Go. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Oh, you all have different translations? Okay, well, let's start over and say it in your own translation. And if you haven't started memorizing it yet, you can read, but don't read too loud because somebody else might think they're getting it wrong. Come on, let's say it again. The Lord is my light. And my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? There you go. Though an army array, though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. Now let's make our faith declaration. I will live life strong. Hallelujah. Now here's the second part. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to, to behold His beauty in the temple, and to inquire or to seek Him in his tabernacle. And so here David declares, oh, we missed verse 5. Verse 5 says, then what? For in the day of trouble, note it, in the day of trouble, he will hide me in his dwelling. He will place me there, secure me, and set me high upon a rock. Now, the interesting thing is, if David said God's going to hide him in the day of trouble, then he says, then he's going to set me high up on a rock. 
it's hard to be hidden when you're, when you're seated high up on a rock. So we're going to talk about that this morning. But our faith declaration from, from those two verses of David's passion, his heart for the house of God is, I will love God's house passionately. Come on, say that with me. I will love God's house passionately. Now, before we develop this, I got three simple things that we'll see in those two verses of how, what does it mean for David to love God's house passionately? And the first thing we need to define is the fact that passion without purpose is reckless. Passion without purpose is reckless. And so David was a passionate man. But not all of his passions were pure. Let that settle in. And the one event that marked his life that, that was so out of character for David was when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. It was a passion, but he was not walking in his purpose. That section of Scripture talks about in the spring of the year when kings go out for war, for fighting. David stayed behind and he was in his palace. It, it was a season where kings were going out for war. It was a season where kings were going out to defend their territory and David was not. David was at home alone in his palace. He wasn't walking in his purpose. He was out of step with the season of his life, but he still had passions in his heart. And when he saw Bathsheba bathing, and then he began to act on those passions. Passion without purpose is reckless. Here's what the scripture says. Proverbs 19, 2. Zeal or passion without knowledge is not good. Neither is it good to be hasty and miss the way. I can't tell you how many times I've encouraged people. It's one thing to hear from God. It's another thing to ask God for this timing. God, God told me to do it. Did God tell you to do it right now? See, it, it, sometimes God speaks things in our life so that we can get focused and directed on God's purpose. And if it seems out of step or it seems out of time, then that's where the scripture comes back that says, they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. What happens then? We have brand new perspective. We can see everything the way God sees it. Then we can hit the ground running and not get weary. Then we can keep on walking and not faint. And so many times, it's not that we get ahead of God because we can't. God isn't bound by time, and no matter how fast you run, you can't get ahead of God. But you can miss God's timing. And when God said, this is the day, this is the time, God said to Moses, now go, I am sending you. And Moses was like, wait a minute, I already tried this. I tried to t do it in my own strength and to set my people free, and I'd had enough of oppression, so I just killed a man. God said, right, that's not my way. Because I'm not going to kill him one at a time. If I want to do it, I can drown the entire Egyptian army in the sea. And I can do in a moment what you can't do in your entire lifetime. So now my timing is I'm sending you. Because Moses had dealt with all those issues in his heart, and now he was walking in humility. Now God had spoke to him. Now God had called him. Now was God's timing. And it was 40 years after Moses thought, missed it. It was 40 years after God spoke and Caleb went out and spied out the promised land and came back with the good report. And when he finally got time to, to step into it, it was God's timing for him to be one of those that crossed over the Jordan. He was 85 years old. But because he'd waited on God and didn't doubt God's promise, when the time came, Caleb could cross over not only with passion, but with strength and vigor. And so he could declare, I'm going to live life strong. I tell you what, at 85, I'm going to be living life strong. 
here or on that side, I'm still going to be living life strong. Come on, somebody. See, and so many times we let life happen to us instead of seizing the day. Instead of living strong, we let strength be taken out of us little by little. And we miss God's timing and we get disappointed and we struggle with that uh, of either not waiting on God, not hearing from God, or not walking in our purpose. So that the passions of our life start working against us instead of for us. David took those passions and he directed them just as intensely in his repentance as he did in his sin. He took responsibility. He repented to the Lord. He repented to those that he had offended and those that he had betrayed. He took his entire kingdom and presented it back to the Lord. He listened to the word of the prophet who came to to rebuke him. In, in the name of the Lord. And he was the king. He was the ultimate authority. But David walked in a level of humility with God because he got his passions in connected, uh, reconnected with his purpose. And I'm here to tell you this morning that some of you are sitting here and your passion is gone. And people talk about being on fire for God. Your, your flame done died out. And the reason is because you stepped out of timing, out of step with your purpose, and you lost track of what God was calling you to. And this morning, it's not about uh, rallying it up and saying, listen, man, we want to, we need to do this. We need to get a bunch of people in church because we're desperate because we need this or we need that. No, we need to live with a passion for the house of God because the the, the world is going to give you substitutes. The world is going to give you many opportunities. The things around you, just the season of life that you're in, the seasons may change, but the, the, the obstacles, the circumstances don't. They're just new. Sometimes they're just different. And you think, man, when I get time, I'm going to do this. When I get time, I'm going to do that. Instead of looking at our hearts and realizing how God has made us and how he's connected us and that, that the, the pastor can't be the body himself, can't even be the head, don't care to be. That you can't be any of us, but all together, we make up the body of Christ. And the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the little toe can't say to the bladder, I don't need you either. That all of those parts as we come together form the body of Christ. And it's an incredible thing when we function together. And if we live with a passion for the house of God and direct our passions toward the house of God, there's some incredible benefits that begin to come into our life. I believe that David lived in a constant, uh, let me rephrase that. I believe one of David's greatest spiritual challenges his entire life was to overcome a spirit of rejection. You see it uh, portrayed all through Scripture, uh, uh, specifically as he was passed over, uh, as Samuel came to anoint the next king, and David wasn't even in the house. Many people believe that David was an illegitimate son, and so therefore was given these tasks and assignments. And, and in fact, in one of his Psalms, he says, Surely in iniquity was I conceived. That's not just in the spiritual sense that we're all born into sin, but but it would be a root issue in David's life. It's why he would be the runt of the litter, if you will, the one overlooked, the one there, even when he came to uh, battle Goliath. And they mocked him and made fun of him because of his size and his stature, but he was uniquely qualified for that event. And then Saul, the king, tried to kill him. The one that he had served and honored and, and continued to walk in honor before God because of his position. And so I believe David battled that spirit of rejection off and on through his whole life. And, and so here he, his desire was to be in a place of safety and security. To be established in God, not self-confident, but in that sense of total acceptance And David found that in the presence of God. And once he found it, he fought to get back there and to keep that and to establish it. It's why David's passion 
was so strong when he directed it to the house of God, it, there it's, I, I can't find an example anywhere in history of one man who gave so much to a building project. And the building project wasn't his palace. The building project was the house of God. We'll, we'll talk about that. But what I want us to see this morning, when we talk about loving God's house passionately, it, it, it's not just exuberance and demonstrative and emotionally and all of that. Nothing significant in life is ever accomplished without passion. If I were to boil it down this morning and, and, and one of the questions that I ask people when I just try to connect, I always try to ask people, tell me your story. And, and that's kind of awkward for people. What, 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 do you want, what do you want to know? I said, well, what's your story? I, I don't want to tell you my story. I'll be glad to, but I'd, I'd rather know your story because people fascinate me. And somewhere along the line in the conversation, I'll ask this question. What's your passion? Let, let me ask it another way. If somebody asks you this morning, what's one thing in your life that, that's non-negotiable? Here's another way. What's, what's one thing that you would say defines you as a person? See, we went on. How's your day? How are you doing? Fine. How are you? It, but that takes it beneath the surface, and it, people always hesitate unless they're walking in their purpose or unless it's obvious. And when people walk in their passion, it's obvious. Th they don't have to strive. They don't have to strain. Uh, uh, they're not trying to impress anybody. It's like, man, I was born for this. I love this. If I don't do this, I, I don't fit. You know, it might not be everybody's deal, but it's my deal, and, and I just love doing it. So let me ask you again this morning. If I were to ask you individually, just in a casual conversation over a cup of coffee or whatever, sweet tea, what's your passion? Would you have to think about it? David said, here's my passion. One thing have I desired. Now, he desired many things, and so do you. I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, man. You know, I'd like to take a trip to whatever, I'd like to, da 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 da, da. I, I, I'd like to. Okay, there's all kinds of desires in our heart, but David was able to weed them all out and focus them on one thing and express all of his energy and all of his passion toward that one thing. And then he said, not only is it my desire to, to, to be in the house of God all the days of my life, but that's the thing I'm going to seek. And, and I'm going to pursue that with everything in me because of God's presence. And he said, the reason that, that that's such a passion in my life is because in that place, the house of God, I get to behold him. Not, not just look at him. Some translations say, gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. I love the New Living Translation. It says, to behold the Lord's perfections. And, and in that place, in God's presence, that's a great term. Because we look at God and, and we see something in God we've never seen before when it's just us and Him. David said He makes His face to shine upon Him and, and, and that God meets Him there, that He hides Him, that He shelters Him. And it's all those terms that David would have known as a military genius. That, that there's times where where uh, you charge and there are other times where you hide. It doesn't mean that you're a coward. It means that you're cunning and that you know warfare and you know the terrain. And there were times when David hid in a cave and, and the stupidest thing would have been to, to, to make himself known or to be discovered. It would have, they, they could have killed him easily. They had him trapped. There were other times where, where, where David would have an escape route one time when he came back into the city of Jerusalem, he knew the city so well, he said, the only way to get in is through that tunnel. 
And so David went underground and he went through that tunnel. It was a secret passageway that only he would know. And so when we get in those times, we, we realize when David's talking about God hiding him and God sheltering him, it's not because he's afraid, it's because he knows how strategic that is. I, I, I had a blessed childhood in one sense, and that was the fact that we got to grow up in, in a time and an era and with parents and grandparents that uh, not only gave us great liberty, but it was totally safe and secure. And part of the safety was that, uh, you know, we believed it took a village to raise a child before Hillary Clinton ever got the clue. And so, no offense, Democrats. Um, <laughs> but, but not only was everybody related or, or knew everybody, uh, so you, if you got in trouble, your, your parents or your grandparents knew about it before you got home. Okay, so you really couldn't get in that much trouble. And so if they just saw you getting a little out of line, but, but one of the greatest things we did, the, the few of us who are gathered there in a little bitty town, is that we, we would build forts. Come on, anybody with me? Okay, and not just any fort, not an obvious fort. We also had a secret fort. And we had secret things in the secret fort. We had secret ammo. We had a stash. Sometimes we'd have secret snacks. Sometimes we'd have whatever and we'd, okay? And it's not like Spanky and the gang with the He-Man Woman Haters Club, but we thought that was kind of cool too, but, but that was a little before my time. What we would do, we would, we would kind of uh, capture the flag on a large scale basis, but sometimes we would substitute uh, tag and all of that with BB guns and in the wintertime with snowballs and it got a little intense at times and and we realized that there was a time where, you know, you could do that and, and everybody was out in an open field, but there were times where you, you needed to retreat. There are times when you, hey, meet me at the fort. And, and so you'd retreat there, and it's, I'm sure other people knew where they were. They weren't that hard to find, but it seemed a whole lot safer sometimes when we'd go into hiding in the fort. The other thing that was a great advantage is when before someone else discovered where our fort was, that we would see them coming down the trail and we could ambush them. We were hidden in our fort and they didn't know where it was. And that gave us a great advantage in the warfare that was there. Now, I believe that God allowed me the privilege of those experiences to teach me some lessons later on in life. Those battles were fun. Seldom came to blows. And, and if they did, my brother is two years older than me. He usually won those. Or, or, or the neighborhood kids and somebody would end up with a bruise and that's it. And then, then we'd have to make up and forgive and we'd get grounded for a day or two and then we'd go right back to it. Are you, are you with me here? Now, now, why do I make that connection? Because David, in his humanity, in his earthiness, in his manly passions. In fact, one of the best books written on David's life is called that, A Man of All Passions. That he was able to master those in a way to direct them toward one thing in his life, the house of God. Not his own palace, not his kingdom, not his finances, not his uh, soldiers, not, not what he had in his life, but the one thing that he found fulfillment, where he found security, where he found total affirmation and acceptance in God, that he desired more than anything else. One thing was to build God's house. So when we say this morning that David's faith declaration was, I will lo love God's house passionately, what does that mean and how did he get there? Let me give you three things real quickly. Number one, David made God's house his priority. He made building God's house and dwelling in God's house and loving God's house his priority. The one thing. Among many, but it was the one thing, the first thing, the foremost thing, as one translation said, the most important thing and the thing I will seek the most is to dwell in the house of the Lord. And then he says, all the days of my life. Now David wasn't saying, man, I wish I was a priest. I, I, I wish I could be uh, one of the Levites. 
I wish I could be one of the tribes that were assigned. I believe David's heart was from Psalm 84. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. I believe David would have said, man, I'll give up my throne if I can just be an usher at church. Are you with me here? It was his passion because it was his priority. And when he prioritized it in his life, there was nothing more important in David's life than the house of God. Not his temple, not his kingdom, not his enemies. Nothing was more important than that. You say, how did David exemplify that? Well, the first thing was when the, the Philistines, Israel's enemies, had captured the Ark of the Covenant. It was the dwelling place of God. It was God saying, this is going to be the place of my presence among you. And God is always orienting us around that. That God is everywhere. But how in the world can he confine himself to one place? Well, he does. And he did. And in Moses' day, it was a tabernacle that they carried with them in the wilderness in their journeys. And then in David's day, not only was it that sense of the tabernacle, but it was specifically focused on God's presence, that ark, and that God dwelt there. And so when he made it his priority, he went to the Philistines, defeated them, and the ark was brought back to Jerusalem. And it was one of the greatest days of David's life until they realized somebody hadn't read the instruction book. And they put it on a cart. It was never commanded to be upon a cart. It, it had gold rings on the side of it, and poles were to be ran down through the sides of it and carried on men's shoulders. Because God didn't want His presence being carried by a cart or a wagon or a donkey or a beast of burden. God wanted His presence to rest upon men. And so the priests who were anointed to do that, set apart to do that, uh, were the ones who put it on a cart. And as they were going, one of the men named Uzzah, uh, as they got to the threshing floor, the cart, uh, 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 the oxen stumbled and the cart jiggled and, and the ark was ready to fall off. And so he tried to, to stop it, to stabilize it on the cart, and he was struck dead immediately. David was really disappointed. He got his feelings hurt. He was frustrated. He got mad at God. And the scripture said that day, David was afraid of the Lord. See, that, that's like, oh, man. And so then when the, the, the priest came and, and gave the instruction and they understood the way in which the ark was to be carried, then they went back and started from that place. They mourned for that guy established it again. Second Samuel chapter six says, then what they did was did it the right way, God's way. And they would pick up that ark, the, the six men who were to carry it, the priests of the Lord, and they would walk six steps. They would set it back down and they would have a sacrifice. And then they'd pick it up and walk six more steps and have another sacrifice. Now, taking that ark, even a short distance would have taken all kinds of time. And so what I want you to see is the extravagance to which David was willing to go because of the presence of the Lord. Not only did he make it his priority, but he made it his pursuit. I'm going to go after it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to capture it. And I'm going to bring it back. And then it's all about the presence of God. It's not about a building. It's not about a structure. It's about that place where God's presence dwells. Everybody say those words with me, if you will, please. God, David made it his priority. He made it his pursuit. And he focused on God's presence. Why is that significant? Because if we're going to love God's house passionately, if we're going to sort out our life and say, what's really important to me? What's really important to my family? Or as we said a few moments ago, what's the one question? What's your passion? That we can't say anything else other than the house of God if we're going to love it passionately. David said, that's my one thing. And when we put ourselves in that position, we begin to live with a passion because we're living in our purpose and we're focused on what God's calling us to do. Now look, 
There's all kinds of things vying for your time. There's all kinds of good organizations asking for your donations. There's all kinds of things that you need. You need to rest. You need to have a Sabbath. You need to work. Scripture says six days you shall work and on the seventh you shall rest. And God will bless everything that you have. If we really wanted to take it to the next level, we could live like Israel. And every seven years, we'd take a whole year off. Come on, somebody. But listen, when we do God's will, God's way, we stay rested. We stay refreshed. We stay empowered. And that's what David began to discover. Look, there's a power with God and in God's presence that I can't replicate. That, that I can't produce. I, any decree that I can sign, any lives that I can put on the line, no matter what victories we have, it, without the presence of God, it's empty. And I see so many families here living lives, not just here as in this building this morning, b- but in America and, and really throughout the world, that, that they're living this thing of just busyness. They're worn out. Their budgets are stretched because, man, I feel like we got to do this and this and this and we have to have a vacation and we have to do this and we have to do that. And man, if I, you know, I, I don't have anything left over to give to God. Let me tell you something that should convict all of us. When, when David, when the ark was brought back and, and rested there in Jerusalem, the first thing David did he, he was there and obviously he was walking around his house, but he was thinking about that ark, that box, that presence of God. And he said to himself, this isn't right. Here I am living in a paneled house of cedar and the ark of God is under a tent. And so he said, I want to build a house for God. So he calls Nathan, the prophet. And he says, Nathan, here's what God put on my heart. And Nathan said, whatever you have in mind, do it, for God is with you. In other words, sounds great to me. Let's do it. Let's build God a house. And then God spoke to Nathan, and he came back and spoke to David, and he said, God said, you're not the one to do it. That God will give you the plans, but he's going to build you a house. And that you are not the one to build a house for him because your hands have shed much blood. But God will raise up an heir, and he will follow you, and he's the one who will build a house for me. And David didn't get disappointed. David didn't go pout. David didn't feel and respond to that spirit of rejection on his life because God didn't reject him. God affirmed him. He just put it in perspective and said, that's not your purpose. Here's your purpose. And when you live your purpose with your passion, it affects generations to come. And so I'm going to establish your line because you had a desire a passion to build me a house, I'm going to establish yours. Now, when somebody says you can't outgive God, David would say, <laughs> let me tell you about that. Amen. I wanted to build him one. He said, no, I'm going to build you one. How many think God could build a better house for you than you could for him? I mean, take a look at the mountains. God said, the earth is my footstool. That's a pretty big footstool. God has large feet. But he said, the heavens are my tabernacle. Is that awesome or what? God decorates with twinkle lights. I mean, that's what he said. Have you seen it at night? It just sparkles. And so God brings it to this place of saying, listen, I don't... I don't think you can build it quite big enough. I'm bigger than the earth. But here's what David did. David said, okay, if, if I'm not the one to build it, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to be the one to provide for it. So, so David gets his resources together. Is there a seatbelt on your chair? If not, there should be this morning. Because David gave millions of dollars in gold and silver. M- millions. 
In fact, David gave 82.5 million pounds of gold and silver. You don't, you don't have to do the math because that's more than you and I have. Okay? Now, here's the awesome part. You say, well, you know, I don't have that kind of money. That's not the question. Do you have that kind of passion? Because here's, here's what happened. David said, then I'm going to get all this stuff together. And not only that, I'm going to get brass. I'm going to get iron for all the fittings. I'm going to collect all the wood. I'm going to go get craftsmen that know how to build all this stuff. I'm going to put the entire construction crew together. I'm going to put supervisors over specific areas. I'm going to get all of this stuff lined up, and I'm going to resource it. I'm going to finance it. Here's the plans, everything, and then I'm just going to hand it off. That's in First uh, Chronicles 22. In chapter 29... After what he's already given, David says this. Besides everything else. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'd just given a billion dollars to the building fund, I don't know that I'd have to give an offering. Are you getting this? We've already taken the offering. I'm not asking you to give. We're not. This isn't make a pledge Sunday. I'm telling you. David's priority and his passion was expressed in this total willingness to give whatever. And not only did he give millions of pounds, we said, where did he get the gold and silver? It was plunder from the enemies that they conquered. So let me ask you that. If God's house is your priority, are you willing to bring the plunder from the battles and the victories that you've walked through in your life? Are you willing to bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of God? Unlimited. I'll tell anybody that'll listen. Let me tell you what God did for me. Not just back in Ot 4 in the good old days, but I'm, here's what God's doing in my life today. Here's my passion for Him. And, and if you can't express that passion to God in that way, th that's the aspect of what priority does God's house have in your life? And for far too many of us, it's just become an add-on. I don't say that out of condemnation. I don't say that out of judgment. I say that as a parent who's walked through the busyness of having young children that grow into older children, and now they have families, and now grandchildren, and all that kind of thing of stuff competing for our time and buying for our time and whatever, and, and a wife who's not demanding but who, who's deserving, and trying to balance all of that out in my life and say, okay, I only have so much time. And God said, right, how are you going to spend it? How are you going to spend the first few minutes of your day? How are you going to spend the first day of the week? How are you going to spend those moments in worship? Are you going to be concise and work with precision? Are you going to work with diligence? Are you going to express that passion when it's a grind? Are we going to be able to express that passion for the house of God reaching out beyond these borders and, and these walls when it's something as unglorious as cleaning toilets at a campground so some kids who can't do it for themselves can enjoy their time and those that want to be there and minister to them like we did at Civitan? Is that going to be an outreach where we just give because of all the resources that we have? Is that awesome or what? See, David's passion was expressed, and here's what's incredible to me. In First Chronicles 29 then, after he's already given 82 and a half million pounds of gold and silver, he, he, he takes up another offering for himself. I mean, from himself. And he said, in my devotion to the house of God, besides all that I've already given, over and above, I also give 110 talents of, of gold and 200 and some talents of silver, whatever it was that he said. And I'm thinking, what? Listen to this. From my personal treasury. Okay. In other words, if it would be our president writing a check from your tax dollars and giving away a portion of our economy to, to build the house of God, that would be one thing. B but if he wrote a 
check from his personal account that's not yours, that you didn't have a hand in, that you didn't have a part in. And so David said, you know what? All that that I've given was plunder from the enemy, but this is from my personal treasury. And so I give all my personal treasury in my devotion, my passion for the house of God. And I will hold nothing back from him. Now watch. That's where it gets tricky. And after he had done that and proclaimed that publicly for, for the honor to build the house of God and his passion for the house of God, and then he said, now who's with me? I know, right? Uh, <laughs> who among you is willing? And here's what's cool. The leaders, the leaders stood up and began to give willingly. And then the last verse there it says that the people then rejoiced at the willing response of their king and their leaders. Why? Because the people saw passion in action. The people saw a passion with a priority. The people saw passion connected to purpose, and it wasn't some reckless deal. It wasn't some gambling thing. It wasn't some deal where somebody gets excited and said, man, I give a thousand. What are you going to give? It, it wasn't a challenge. It wasn't a throwdown. With no manipulation whatsoever. David in his passion said, I'm cleaning out my accounts. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to provide for the house of God. That's passion. But he said, not only is it, is it going to be my priority and I express my passion that way, it's going to be what I pursue. And he says, one thing have I desired, but it's not just a desire, it's a pursuit. And that will I seek after all the days of my life. He wasn't talking about moving into the church, moving into the house of God. But he connected it so much in his heart with God's presence and that place where his presence dwelt that David was really saying, I'd rather be there than here. And he didn't despise where he lived or what he had. He gave praise to God and he said, Lord, who am I? And who are this people that you would honor us in such a way? Look at all that you provided for us. Even in that, David's expressing his passion to God and for the house of God and the presence of God and realizing every blessing he had in his life, every victory that he won, every honor that was given him as a warrior, as a worshiper, as a king, as a person, as a father, as he walked and led his kingdom was just from God. That level of humility and gratitude is what sustained David all of his life. It's how he expressed that passion. And the one time in his life where he stepped out of God's purpose, actually there was a couple. The other time is where he numbered all the fighting men. And it was like, let me see how much power I got. Let me see how many warriors we have. And God said, it's never been about that. Remember Gideon? We sent a bunch of those troops home. With God, it's never about numbers in that sense of how much firepower do you have? And God says, watch this. And he said, you'll defeat an entire army with a torch and, and a planter box, a clay pot, sick them. You, you'll cause walls to fall down because you blow a trumpet and shout. But you don't do that outside of God's will, and you can't do that outside of God's purpose. Listen, when we begin to see church as a spectator sport or, or a consumer thing, what's in it for me? That has become a marketing thing. Man, you got to come this week because we want you to come next week because, you know, we want you to keep on coming because we want to help you develop habits in your life that are going to help you. And then that whole dynamic. You know one thing David never said? Church is boring. You know one thing David never said? This ain't worth it. How, how can you say that? Because people don't give 
billions of dollars to what they're not passionate about. And people don't give lifetime offerings uh, 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 in addition to the lifetime offering they've already given. For David, it wasn't just even an investment. It was, this isn't mine anyway. It wasn't that it didn't have value. David knew the value of gold. Paid for it with men's lives. Captured it from enemies. But he also knew that the true blessing left Israel when God's presence did with the Ark of the Covenant. And so David's passion was not redirected at conquering armies and and getting more territory. David's passion began to be focused on the presence of God. He made it his priority. He made it his pursuit. And his life's passion began to focus on God's presence. When they brought the ark back, they got it halfway back and when when the tragedy was there with Uzzah, uh, the, the people were afraid. Nobody knew what to do, so they took the ark and they put it in the home. Uh, a man named Obed Edom said that you could just park it here, put it here, till we figure out what we're going to do. And during the time the ark was in Obed Edom's house, God blessed everything in his house, everyone in his house, every so obviously that David recognized it. And it was his heart, it was his passion, and he said, not only did take it from him, it wasn't envious, it was, again, a recognition, God calling him back to the thing of, man, I miss God's presence. God, what can I do to get back in your presence and to get your presence back among your people? It wasn't just, what can I do to be blessed? But then David certainly recognized the blessing of that. That God would hide him in his tabernacle. He would shelter him from the intrigues of his enemies. And that he would set him high upon a rock. There in your notes, I want you to see the benefits of having a passion for the house of God. The benefits of loving God's house passionately is that, first of all, God will put you out of sight. That God will hide you in his presence. Not because you're afraid or because he's afraid for somebody to find you, that God hides you in his presence so you can discover the hidden things that are in God. And when God hides you in his presence, you stop being a target for the enemy. If he can't find you, he can't get you. Huh? So God puts you out of sight. I'll hide you in my tabernacle, in my shelter. The second thing is, God will put you out of reach. He said, he'll set me high on a rock above all my enemies. People say, Pastor, it's like, man, the enemy's after me. He's just he's right there. I mean, he's just on me. I said, what you need to do is get in the presence of the Lord. Not out of panic, not, not out of fear. That come into the presence of the Lord, come in an aspect of worship, calm your spirit, quiet your mind, whatever you need to do. And it's like, no, 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 you don't understand the battle's here, the battle's here, the battle's here. Well, I'd rather fight the battle from a position of strategy and strength where God sets me high up on a rock, and then if I am the target, they're going to have to shoot a long way up there to get me. And if God's going to set you on a rock, He's not going to make you vulnerable. He's our shield, He's our defender. The New Testament says that we're to have the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth buckled around our waist. We're to have our feet prepared and we're to have a shield of faith and a sword of the Spirit and we're to pray in the Spirit on all occasions. If you're sitting high upon a rock with your armor on in the presence of God, that's the most secure place you could ever be. See, what the enemy wants to do is single you out to expose you. What God wants to do is set you high up on a rock to get you out of reach. And so not only is your praise to them, but then you can taunt your enemies and go, nah, 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 nah. See me, but you can't reach me. Listen, that's where David made his boast in God. I'm not talking about some immature, you know, battle of words. I'm talking about the enemy of your soul. And he comes and says, man, I got you. You're mine. You sinned. You yielded. That's it. Where's God now? 
That moment right there, yeah. Where you know you're dead in the water. And you know he's right. The same moment when the prophet came to David and he told him a story about sheep. And it moved the heart of the shepherd. And David said, who is that man? And the prophet said, you are that man. So David got in that place and, oh God. Where not only does he repent to the Lord, but he finishes the great shepherd's psalm in 23. Psalm 23 by saying what? Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me, follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David said, I might be out here in the shepherd field. I might be walking these uh, uh, trails and finding water and grass for my sheep. But my heart's in the house of the Lord. Enemies aren't pursuing me. Goodness and mercy's after me. And that gives me confidence and security. I don't have to run in fear. I just let them push me forward into my purpose. No, God said, come on, that's good, that's good, let's go. And mercy says, look, I got you. I got your back. You can't fall very far. I'm here. And so David lives with this confidence and saying, surely, goodness and mercy. And he ends by saying, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Come on, say it with me this morning. I will love God's house passionately. Father, I pray that you would do that work and put that in every one of our spirits this morning with strength. God, that you would speak a word, that you would bring life, that you would meet us at the very point where we are. Every ounce of discouragement, every tinge of bitterness, every place in our life of subtle disappointment, Father, certainly those areas where sin speaks the loudest. The place where we're keeping secrets instead of coming into the secret place, sharing our hearts with God. Father, that passion would come alive in our hearts that you would meet us here. We thank you for it. We give you praise and glory. I just want everybody to remain seated for a moment. I've asked uh, Jamie to come and share. She sent me an email this past week, and we were talking and praying about some things. And uh, it, it just so fit this morning with what we were doing. And, and uh, so we talked a little bit beforehand, and I said, you know, this would be a great deal to, to do that and just kind of illustrate it on a practical level for us this morning. So I want her to share. Not so much a prophetic word, but just a word of exhortation for us this morning. And so would you just listen to this and then we'll pray together before we go. Um, I don't know if you've ever had those moments in your life where God has spoken something to you and you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was Him. And this was one of those moments for me. Um, I was sitting in a board meeting this past week, a very long one that I was not very excited about for pregnancy choices. And God used an article that was meant for pregnancy choices to speak a word to me for our body. And I believe um, wholeheartedly in what Pastor Mike was saying about everybody has a passion. And, and what's your passion? I believe it's one step further. I believe that God has anointed every single one of us for a specific purpose on, 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 in his, for his kingdom. And so um, this article was about um, being appointed or being anointed. And um, I just want you to listen to my prayer th that he spoke to me for the body, but also these words from this article that were really meant for you today. He said, or this is my prayer. I really felt that um, these words are for our body. I feel as if the Lord wants us to pray for his anointing to fall and rest in our church and on every individual life um, that's represented by our body. I feel like he wants us, the people, to pray and be passionate about operating under his anointing in their personal lives, but also to utilize that anointing and gifting in our church. 
I can only begin to imagine the movement that could happen within our body if everyone would live under God's anointing. These are the words from the article. With God's anointing comes power and presence. There's a special blessing bestowed on God's anointed. It is the blessing of God's power manifest in ways only seen through the work of God's chosen. God's anointed shout and walls fall. I just feel like that was so incredible. It struck me and I stopped and reread it again, so I'll say it again. This is for all of us. When God's anointed shout, walls fall. They lift their feeble staff and seize part. They speak God's work boldly and movements are begun that free men's souls. God's anointed do the miraculous because they are the servant of the Almighty. There is a unique presence of God in the lives of those that God anoints and called to leadership through that anointing. Without it, we are continually thrown back upon ourselves to make things work. But with it, we have the resources of heaven at our disposal if we will be the faithful servant. God's anointed will do anything God asks. Anything. God's anointed will seek God's will with a passion. They will not move without it, and they will not be diverted from their course once they have it. God's anointed will love what God loves and hate what God hates. That means loving God's people, God's church, God's environment, God's resources, and God's plan. It also means hating sin in every form and coming against anything that stands between God's loving plan and its accomplishment. God's anointed are people of keen discernment. They are branches who are solidly engrafted in the true vine. God's anointed are servants, first, last, and always. And God's anointed have only one passion, to know and do God's will that he might have the glory. And I ended it by saying this. We're talking about faith declarations. And um, for my husband and my family, this is what what I said. As for me and my house... We will be passionately seeking the Lord on how to use the anointing that he's given us and put on our lives to benefit his divine plan in this body. And I'm going to be really bold and ask the question that you asked, who is with me? Who is willing to pray and see what anointing he has placed on your life? And how can you pour it into this body to accomplish his divine plan and will for this church? Amen. Jamie asked the question. I asked the question in a different way. Now the response is yours. Who's with me? Who's with us? If that's you this morning and God's speaking to your heart, He's stirring something there, you might not know exactly what that is, but you're just saying, God, I want to be willing. I want to be one of those that just fulfill that purpose. Jesus said He would build His church. And they would knock down walls and the walls wouldn't be able to prevail against them. And that Jesus not only built his church on a revelation of his word, he anointed his church. Not just with oil, but with the Holy Spirit and with power. And when we walk in that anointing, nothing shall be impossible for those who believe. And when people walk into environments where nothing is possible, the positive side of that is most of us live so much of our life with limitations they're false they're lies they're they're strongholds but when God breaks those and sets us free and we walk into an environment of possibility that that there's no well that's impossible that's what Goliath thought until David cut his head off That's what the Philistines thought. That's what Jericho thought. That's what cancer thinks. That's what divorce says. That's what that spirit of rejection that works against our life and the spirit of independence that that causes us to move towards selfishness rather than selfless sacrifice says. And so today, I just see such potential. friend of mine preached a message here a few years ago. UC Bones. 
but I see an army. And I really do believe there's an army rising up. There's special forces, there's infantry, there's supply lines, there's medics, there's everything we need to be the people of God and to conquer great victories, to win great victories, not only for ourselves but for others. So if that's you this morning and God's stirring in your heart, would you just stand with me? Come on all over the building. Can we pray together? Would you lift your hands to the Lord? Father, I just thank you this morning. That it's in the moments of our hearts where we make a resolve, a decision, where we make that commitment and sometimes our passion is focused outwardly and expressed even violently. Other times it's focused inwardly and it turns into such strength and confidence and power that it changes our life and transforms everything about us, our thinking, our words, our actions. Father, we declared over our lives that we're going to live our life strong. We're declaring over our lives this morning based on your word. Father, we're going to love your house passionately. And as we do, God, I pray that we would love the place where your presence dwells. And we make that declaration over our lives that we're going to walk in the anointing that you've given us. Father, we're going to run our race with perseverance. And we're going to walk and not faint. And we're going to see the salvation of the Lord. God, I thank you this morning for the work that you're doing. The deep work in our hearts that begins to work itself out in every aspect of our lives, in Jesus' name. Father, I give you praise and glory and honor for this people, this body. I thank you for the privilege of pastoring people that want to not only master their passions, but focus them on the things of God. People who love your presence. People who make God's house the ultimate priority in their life Lord I bless them today I bless you with all that is within me and a willing spirit Father I say thank you and to this your people I just echo the words of David who am I and who is this people that we would be so blessed by God we would be so honored to have you speak and dwell among us. So, Father, we cherish that. We honor it. We give our lives in response, in worship unto you. We say, here am I, God. Use me. Send me. Anoint me for the task. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Would our prayer team slip out and take your places around, if you will, and if there's any need in your life this morning, uh, we want to just want you just connect at a point of prayer. Uh, want to be praying for Miss Tina Walters. She had a bad fall this week and uh, had a fracture in her hip. She's in surgery right now, so we're just praying healing and blessing over her life. We're playing, praying healing and blessing over y'all's. And uh, one other thing I want to encourage you to do on Facebook or on Twitter, uh, if you would, uh, just in your responses or if you're posting things about that, uh, the message, uh, use the hashtag, I declare. Hashtag, I declare. If you don't know what a hashtag is, it's something that we have for breakfast. Um, <laughs> hashtags, bacon and eggs. That, if you do know what a hashtag is, then we're cool. If not, we'll, we'll, we'll encourage it. But what we can do then is, is start tracking that and we can follow that all the way through. So hashtag, I declare, and then you can make not only a declaration, but just share words of encouragement and what God's doing in your life, amen? The best is yet to come. You know why? Because I'm gonna live life strong. You know how? I'm gonna love God's house passionately. Hallelujah. Join us next week when we talk about, and I will hold my head high. Hallelujah. Bless you, everybody. If you want to receive prayer, time of ministry for anything, we encourage you to come.
not, be blessed. Have a great week in the Lord.